So uh, we're on lesson seven of our spring quarter. The title of the lesson is The Little Scroll and the Two Witnesses, and it's Revelation chapters 10 and 11. So, Lord, we pray that as we move into, of course, this uh, whole book is, has many symbols in it, but there are a lot of symbols here that you give us discernment uh, and to accurately interpret the symbols and uh, that we might know what is coming in the future and that we might glorify you uh, in Jesus name amen. amen okay so we're on uh, let's see Revelation 10 and so up to this point we've gotten through the sixth trumpet judgment which um, uh, you know it's a lot of weird stuff, demonic activity. A third of the world has been killed after a third of the, after a fourth of the world was killed earlier. So we're down to half of the Earth's population at this time point, and I'm sure more people are dying <laughs> as we go. Right that's right. Um, yeah, that's right. So uh, the tribulation period is a dangerous time to live. A lot of people will not survive it. COVID is nothing. Yeah, COVID is nothing compared to this. So uh, the first section, section A, is the angel and the little scroll. And so I just wanted to make a mention about timing. Um, I believe that the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments in, are indicating the birth pains of, uh, well, the seal judgments in particular, the birth pangs of Matthew 24. And I do believe that the trumpet judgments are found in the first half, first three and a half years of the tribulation. And so chapter 10 um, is an interesting chapter and a bit of a difficult chapter. Yeah. And, uh, but... Well, we'll read it, and then we'll talk about it, I guess. So if I can get somebody to read chapter 10 of Revelation. It's 11 verses. Okay, thank you. So we get a, quite a sight here. Verse 1, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his feet was like the sun, face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So he's clothed in cloud. There's a rainbow on his head. So what does the rainbow remind us of, biblically? Yeah. The, Right, the Noahic covenant to not flood the earth again, and the Lord has been faithful to that covenant, and he will continue to be. And he is has a face like the sun and feet like pillars of fire. So this is an awesome, awesomely powerful creature here. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, every now and then you see they say it's not just an angel in Revelation, it's a strong angel. And this is one of those. He's a strong angel. Um, and then in contrast to th this, he, he's humongous, and he his face is like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. And then he, in contrast, he had in his hand a little book. Yep, which was open, and he placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land, which makes you think he, like he's a giant or something. He's huge. Yes. Yeah, and this little book was open. Now, this contrasts with the scroll or book in chapter 5, doesn't it? Let's look at, back at chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. So this book is open. The book in chapter 5 is closed and sealed with seven seals. And, uh, yeah, I'm supposed to preach, Lord willing, next Sunday. And 
we'll we'll look at that at that time, the sealed book. But here the, the angel has this little book that's open. And things like this have happened in the past to the prophets. So John is acting as a prophet here. And back in Ezekiel 2, 8 and 9, Ezekiel was uh, commissioned, and he says, Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. And so the rebellious house he's talking about here is the house of Israel. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat the scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me the scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach, and fill your body with the scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. So that has to do with prophetic truth that is being received by the prophet from God. And in Ezekiel, or not Ezekiel, in Zechariah also this sort of thing happened. In Zechariah chapter 5, Zechariah, Then I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, What do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and it's width 10 cubits. <laughs> then he said to me, This is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. So anyway... And he, this is the angel, cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. Some things remain mysteries. This happened. John heard it, and he was told to write, and he started to write, and then he said, no, don't do that. So some things remain mysteries. Uh, the Lord tells us not everything. <laughs> he tells us, yeah, he tells us what we need to succeed. That's what he tells us. He tells us what we need to succeed. They don't need to know everything all at once. Um, yeah, it, because some things are not tolerated. So anyway, this is Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Uh, it speaks of this concept. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So that is success. And then also... Paul had something like that happen to him. It says he knew a man who was taken to the third heaven, and he was told things that were inexplicable and couldn't be uttered in words that were too wonderful for him to say. And, of course, so, so he didn't tell us what they, what they were. We don't know what they were. Yeah. So there are some things, and, you know, I'm hoping that we'll find out what these things are. Later, yeah, but now we don't get to know. And this, yeah, these seven, you know, I've, in the commentaries, they like to speculate about these things, but I don't think you should speculate about what that is. So anyway, there are some things that we don't know. Only the Lord knows. Verse 5, Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. So the question, what delay is that? Well, what has been delayed forever 
according to us, the God's kingdom, right? When, uh, so just like uh, Jana, the apostle Peter says, <laughs> say, yeah, Second Peter 3, 8, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's right. That's right. So, um, so yeah, but that process, the Lord is very patient, very, very patient, but not infinitely patient, because he has promised a kingdom. So that kingdom has to come someday. And that is what it's talking about here, that there will be delay no longer. And then verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, so this is the seventh trumpet now, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants the prophets. So the mystery of God... What do you think the mystery of the God is in that context? I think that is the kingdom itself. And that mystery was first revealed in Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor, had a dream. He was going to kill all the wise men unless they told him first what his dream was. Isn't that a great job? Yes, and then that they interpret the dream. And so Daniel prayed, and God told him the dream and what it meant. So Daniel 2, verse 35, Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then the interpretation of that, Daniel also gave to Nebuchadnezzar. And that was, in the days of those kings, and those kings being the Gentile kings that make up the feet and the toes of the statue, and those are the ten kings of the Antichrist kingdom that will be worldwide over the earth. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people, so Israel will be the ruling nation in God's kingdom. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So Nebuchadnezzar was the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Back in what, 586 B.C., that was the last Davidic king reigning on David's throne was Zedekiah. And so ever since that time, Israel has been under the thumb of Gentile powers until now, up until now, you know, and now they're they're theoretically out of it and they're they're their own uh, country, but they're still kind of dependent on Gentile powers. Um, and so that will end yeah, yeah, and that will end when Jesus uh, uh, sits on the throne. So that is what is being announced here with the seventh uh, trumpet, although remember that the seventh trumpet is just the beginning of the bowls. <laughs> seventh trumpet, just like the seal, the seventh seal unleashed the trumpets and the bowls. Seventh trumpet unleashes the bowls, which are total destruction. So verse 8, chapter 10, verse 8, Then the voice which I heard from heaven I heard again. Remember whose voice that was? Jesus keeps hearing from heaven. 
I mean, John, I gave it away. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's Jesus that he's hearing from heaven. I heard again speaking with me and saying, go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. That's what was told to Ezekiel, too, wasn't it? That if he ate this book, it would taste sweet. Here in John, he says, when it gets to your stomach, it'll be bitter. Why? Because it's telling of judgment. That's what was going on with Ezekiel, too. Uh, Ezekiel was to prophesy about judgment on Israel. So that's why it's bitter in the stomach. And you're to take it and eat it, so you're to take it and digest the contents. That, and that's what we are to do with God's Word. We are to digest its contents. So God's Word contains pronouncements of judgment. Uh, but for every believer, it will contain. Yeah, so I mean, it's the way to judgment for, for the believer. It's the way to peace and fellowship with God. And, you know, Jeremiah experienced exactly the same thing. Because what Jeremiah, his whole, his whole life was declaring judgment on Israel, and they hated him for it. They tried to kill him. He told God, I don't want to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and he couldn't stop. So this is uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. It says, your words were found and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, the Lord God of hosts. Yeah can't take it anymore so then the last verse verse 11 and they said to me you must prophesy again occurring concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings so i think what this little book is it's little because it's um you know half of the tribulation period is past and so it's about the rest that wasn't my original idea but another teacher said that which I think is reasonable. Um, so John is going to prophesy again about the rest of what's going on. And now we're in basically at the end of chapter 9, that was the sixth trumpet judgment, and chapter 10, chapter 11, all the way through to, well, the end of chapter 11 is the seventh trumpet. So we're in an interlude right now where it is explaining things that are going on in this time period that we've gone through up to through the seventh trumpet judgment. And so the next chapter will speak of the two witnesses. So let me read that. So that's section B, the introduction of the two witnesses, and that's verses 1 through 6, chapter 11. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire." Verse 11, uh, verses 1 and 2, there's given me a measuring rod. 
Someone told him, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it, but leave out the court of the Gentiles, basically the outer court. And it says the Gentiles will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. And then it says, yeah. So all through Revelation, you'll hear 1260 days, 42 months. Um, other places you'll hear time, times, and half a time. You know, they're all synonyms for the same time period. They're three and a half years. Um, according to the Jewish 30-day month. So the court of the Gentiles will be tread underfoot for 40 months. And I'm thinking that's probably in the second half of the tribulation period. Verse 3, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So how long is 1260 days? I already said that. That's three and a half years. That's three and a half years counted out in days. So um, I have a paper that I tried to find, and I can't find it by... Um, his last name is Whitcomb. Him and Henry Morris wrote the Genesis Flood together. And he argued that they their uh, ministry was in the first half of the tribulation period, which uh, I think makes sense also, so I buy into that. Uh, Whitcomb and Morris wrote the Genesis Flood. And uh, he was a, he was a Hebrew scholar. He just passed away just recently. So yeah, I think that in Jerusalem, these two guys will be there, and it, they will have supernatural power that God will give them. It's like oh whenever they feel like it. Once, you know, it's like you know what's going to happen. It's like, oh, let's do this again. Yeah. You know, oh no, let's do this again. No, I mean, I'm boggling. Yeah, the Lord has given them latitude. Yes, to do what they want. Um, and so it says they will prophesy. It doesn't really say what they will prophesy. Plagues are coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah what, you know, what they're going to prophesy is that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Messiah is coming. The kingdom of God is coming with the Messiah, with him. And so you should repent now, you know, even though you will probably be killed. Because at this time, to be a believer in Jesus will be to be an enemy of the state. And the state will be ultimately powerful. Yeah, and many, many people will, they will have a successful ministry. So verse 4, it says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So that makes us think of something in the book of Zechariah. I, I have written down here 1 through 6. So anyway, Ze Zechariah 4, 1, Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from him, his sleep. He said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on the top of it, and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts, belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zeri Babel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the olive trees were like the source of the spirit that powered. This is what it says. Yeah, so they were prophesying through the power of the spirit. And actually, that is how we are to live today, right? We are to live today in the power of the Spirit. Because uh, anything we do in our flesh is no good. And that, that is called walking in the Spirit. Okay, or abiding in Jesus is walking by the Spirit. And that's how they were prophesying, through the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit makes things happen. <laughs> you know, without the Spirit, nothing happens. 
So yeah. nothing good happens, yeah. So um, and then verses 5 and 6, and if anyone wants to harm them, uh, it's a bad deal. If anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. So the Lord turns them into dragons, kind of. Their mouths are flamethrowers, and um, which is something that is fantastical to th to think about. Yeah, yeah, and so th this is why the extremities of the Bible are challenging for us because they explain things that we have no experience with, and so this is this is one of those things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But uh, we take God at his word. Yeah, we take God at his word. And uh, they can also turn the waters to blood. They can strike the earth with plagues as they desire. And, uh, you know, if they're being led by the Spirit, they will not do it vindictively. Um, but they are human. So you don't want to make them mad <laughs> and people will not like them people will not like them you know we see what our culture is getting like now it will get more and more that way more that way until it's maximally that way it will be satanic fully satanic at that time you know it's well in its way now and so <laughs> these people will be despised Okay, so that is the introduction of the two witnesses. Section C is the death and resurrection of the two witnesses. That's verses 7 through 14. Somebody want to read that part? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, okay, so um said when they have finished their testimony, so that, and this is true about us too. We are indestructible until... We do the works that the Lord has for us. So when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So their testimony will occur. We're told the number of days that this will happen. They will do this. They will come out every day and tell people about this. If someone tries to attack them, they will flame through them. Um, if it will benefit their ministry, they will cause a drought. Um, they may cause a plague if it will benefit their ministry, and this will go on for 1,260 days. And on the 1,261st day, it says the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them. Who do you think that is? Yeah, I think that... Yeah, I think that relates to the Antichrist, the beast. Um, the beast is uh, relates to the is the Antichrist, and his. Uh, you know, he, he some of his minions are in the abyss. We saw them in chapter nine. They were the demons that participated in the Genesis six event, where they're making Nephilim. Or you know, bearing Nephilim, causing women to bear Nephilim. Um, yeah, I have a feeling that when the peace treaty is signed with Israel, these uh, witnesses will start to prophesy in Jerusalem. And they are destined to be killed by the Antichrist. It's written down in the Bible how they will be killed. <laughs> and so that is... What will happen? They will be killed by the Antichrist. Yeah. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically, okay, now, what does mystically mean? Mystically means this is going to be a figure of speech. Okay? I mean, when, you, when you're when you reading along and it says, um, you know, like, for example, it says they turn the waters into blood. They can turn them into blood. There's no figure of speech there. There's no indication of a figure of speech. 
So I would take that literally. But here it says, the great city which mystically is called. This is a figure of speech. It's called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now that's a clue. Yeah. Where was the Lord crucified? In Jerusalem, right? So at that time, and this is happening now, Jerusalem is becoming like Sodom. Exactly. Yeah, because, you know, they have gay right parades. They have the support LGBTQ XYZ. You know, they, they're a total sexual immorality. So that is sexual immorality. And Egypt, what does Egypt represent? It represents bondage. What was happening in Egypt? They were in bondage. And they're in bondage because they refused to turn to their Messiah. The, uh, the Jews, they're in bondage under rabbinic Judaism. And they refuse to turn to their Messiah, so that keeps them in bondage. So that is in Jerusalem where the Lord is crucified. So that, I think, I think that's a pretty easy one to interpret. Verse 9, those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days. Okay, now if you lived in the 1700s and you read that, the in 1700s, people had this book, and they read that, and they looked at that, and they said, how could that happen? You know? Well, we know exactly how it can happen right now. Look on the Internet. <laughs> you can look on the Internet now and see traffic cams in real time right now yeah. uh, across the world. You know? That's how it'll happen. So those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Why? Because they want to desecrate them. It's, yeah, it's, it's, de it's, it's a desecration. And, um, and then, as if that wasn't enough, verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So... They will have a satanic gift exchange, like at Christmas time. A satanic gift exchange. And that's because they were so irritated by these two. They were, they were just driving them crazy. And so they're celebrating that they're dead. Until verse 11. And then it says, But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Can you imagine? Because what were they doing before? Yeah. They were flamethrowers, they were causing yeah. droughts and all this stuff. And they're like, oh no. Now they're going to get heart attacks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And they heard, but you know, the Lord is not um, sadistic. So, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. Yeah, you know, they're getting more and more hardened now. Yeah. They're really hardened. So, and this is a this is a rapture here, where it's an, a resurrection associated with a catching up into heaven. This is a rapture. Now, our rapture has already taken place at this time, and we are in heaven already. Thank goodness. So, they rise again. So, that makes me want to read the, the rapture passage because I, I find it very encouraging. This is what we are looking for. We're not going to see any of this, right? I want to keep reminding you of that. Except from heaven. Yeah, if, it, unless there's close circuit TV. Yeah, if, if we have a view from heaven, then we can see it. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, <clears throat> But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And the comfort is that you will not see this stuff. 
So whoever's listening online, turn to Jesus today. So you won't have to see this stuff. That's right. So, um, okay, then 13 and 14. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So there's still some who have some tenderness toward God there, right? Then it tells us the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. Remember, the eagle in the air told us three woes were coming. So an earthquake, I take that literally. Tenth of the city fell. I take that literally. 7,000 people died. I take that literally in Jerusalem. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So some people were saved during this. And that's a good thing. So there's one more woe left, right? Anybody remember what the first woe was? The first woe was the fifth trumpet judgment, which is the release of the demonic locusts. Yeah, and the second trumpet was the release of the demonic army of 200 million that killed one-third of mankind. And uh, and I guess what's going on with the witnesses and this earthquake. So that's the second woe. And the third woe will be the seventh trumpet, which releases seven bowls. Seven what? Seven bowl judgments. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And those are basically total devastation of the earth. So section D, the sounding of the seventh trumpet. I'll read that section. Verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. That's us, guys representative of us, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. <laughs> it does. That's right. Now, this little section, verses 15 through 11, are in the chronology, okay? So the chronology moves along. This is the, the seventh trumpet. And the next four chapters are going to be an interlude where we talk about some of the things that happen in the middle of the tribulation period. There's, there's a lot that goes on there. So verse 15, the birth pangs of Matthew 24 are about to bear fruit. Contained in the seventh trumpet are the seven bowls. Once Christ has the kingdom, he has it forever. The times of the Gentiles, you know, is really one kingdom rises, it it rots, it yeah. falls. Another kingdom rises, it rots, it falls. You know, uh, over and over again, there was um, Babylon. You know, first was Egypt, and then Assyria, and then Babylon, then uh, Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome, and they rot. They rise, and then they fall. When Jesus rises, he never falls. He's very patient. So, uh, yeah, verse 16, I already said this really, but and the 24 elders just sit on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worship God. So the elders represent the church, and we fall on our faces in worship. The nations are enraged. That reminds us of Psalm 2, doesn't it? 
Psalm 2 says, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then it says, Do homage to the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 2 sounds like this moment here, you know. The nations are enraged. The Lord is laughing. He says, come on, guys. <laughs> Don't you know the jig's up? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. The jig is up. And then um, in the temple of God, we see heaven, the temple of God in heaven now. So this is the true temple, not the copy was opened. And you could see the Ark of His Covenant in there. And then there were again flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. So it's just, you know, more disasters on its way. <laughs> Basically, that's. Yeah, it's this is unrelenting disaster. So, Lord, we thank you for this glimpse into the future. Um, we feel, I feel bad for the earth and the morons that live on it. You know, of which we are part. Yes, we are part. And we pray that people come to their senses before this happens and put their trust in you. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen.